Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to the witnesses, thank you all. I did my back of the envelope math, and I think this is 156 years of service to the United States that's sitting before us at the table in military capacity, uh, and we owe you thanks, but we ought to also listen to you. Um, for the record, I just note I voted uh, will, uh, with, with enthusiasm for the nominations that were before us earlier, but there were 42 nominations to lieutenant colonel and colonel, and there was not one woman among the nominees. The, those nominated were uh, superb qualifications, but that is a fact of interest, and I just wanted to bring it up that people on the committee pay attention to that. Um, the sequester uh, was voted in by Congress in August of 2011, and I think as some of your testimony indicated, and as we all know, when it was voted in, everyone wanted it not to happen. The idea was that Congress would find a better path forward. All agreed that a sequester path would have exactly the kinds of consequences that you have testified to this morning. Since August of 2011, as you've also testified, the world hasn't gotten simpler. We've seen the rise of ISIL, an Ebola threat, increasing Russian bellicosity toward neighboring nations, North Korea cyber attacks, a devastating Syrian civil war, a decline in the situation in Libya and other nations in Africa, flexing of the muscles by the Chinese, flexing of the muscles by the Iranians. The challenges have gotten only more intense since August of 2011. But while the challenges are getting more intense, we are needlessly inflicting pain through budgetary mechanisms on our military. General Mattis testified yesterday, and the chairman uh, indicated this as in his opening statements. It's a pretty powerful statement when you think about it. No foe in the field can wreak such havoc on our security that mindless sequestration is achieving. There's some powerful foes in the field, but General Mattis's testimony yesterday, yesterday was that none of them will have as much effect on American national security as sequester, and that's why it's imperative that we reverse it. Um, we have to take steps to reverse it. If you look at budgets, budgets tell you about priorities. We can say all we want about how we value military service and the defense mission, but at the end of the day, our budgets tell us something about what we really value. In 2015, 1.3% of America's GDP was spent on interest payment. That number is rising. 3.2% of the, of the GDP was on defense. That number is dramatically falling. 3.3% on non-defense discretionary, that number's falling even more dramatically. 5.6% of our GDP was spent on federal health care, that is growing dramatically. 4.9% on Social Security, that is growing dramatically. But by far the largest item on the expenditure side is tax expenditures, $1.5 trillion a year of deductions, exemptions, loopholes, credits, et cetera. 8.1% of the GDP and rising. What our budget is telling us is that we support tax expenditures much more than any of these other areas, and we need to find appropriate ways to rebalance the budget in sequester and invest what we need to to combat the challenges that we've discussed. General Dunford, I wanted to dig in with you a little bit on some of the testimony you gave about the relationship in the Marines between readiness and forward deployment. Uh, we've demanded of you that you be more forward deployed in the aftermath, for example, of, this, of the horrible tragedy in Benghazi. We've asked you to restructure to have expeditionary units and rapid response teams closer to the action. We've asked the same of other service branches. But forward deployment has a cost. Talk a little bit about what sequester does in terms of whether you have folks forward deployed or whether you have to have them back home. And if that's the case, what is the effect of, of that on our ability to respond to crises? Thank you, Senator, for that question. Our ability to be forward deployed is, is based on our capacity. And, and as I mentioned earlier, today uh, our units are deploying for about seven months, they're home for 14 months and back for seven months. If we get sequestered, we will reduce capacity. Uh, and we'll reduce capacity to the point where we'll be closer to a one-to-one -one deployment to dwell rate, meaning that our Marines will be deployed for seven months, our Marines and sailors back out for seven months and deployed for seven months. So that's a, that's a pretty significant cost. Again, we talked earlier about both the impact on training, very difficult to maintain core competencies with that quick a turnaround, and we have experience doing that. We were at or about that level about four or five years ago uh, at the peak of the requirements in Afghanistan and uh, in Iraq. And so, you know, that's the biggest impact on sequestration is that reduced capacity. Now, 
That's the most significant one. The other impact, though, is because of its mindlessness and it cuts across all of the lines, it will also have an impact on home station training, facilities that are available, amount of ammunition, amount of fuel, amount of batteries, the things that you need to do to properly train when you're back at home station. All of that degrades two things, Senator. One is uh, the number of Marines that are forward deployed, and, and as, as we've discussed before, uh, in the wake of Benghazi, I think there's an expectation that Marines and sailors will be there and respond within hours to a threat against our diplomatic corps, U.S. citizens, or interests abroad. The fewer Marines and sailors there are forward deployed, the longer timeline it is for us to be able to respond. And with sequestration, I also have concerns over time about the capabilities that those Marines have, both from an equipping and a training perspective, and the human factors, again, because of that quick turnaround from a deployment to dwell perspective. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.